I desire, if you would stand with me, and would you welcome Prophet Ellen Ross this morning? He's come to minister. Thank you so much. Good morning. It's good to be here. That's what you call a welcome, but it's nothing compared to the rich welcome we will all receive one day when we enter into heaven. Yes. Praise the Lord. We're just having a warm up this morning. Church is fun. A few of you have been saying this to me over the first service. And into the second service, church is fun. There's no room for the frozen chosen. We send you to Alaska in January and say, freeze there. Our God is so good. I mean, he's relational. We catch who he is. Perhaps the most powerful prayer we can ever pray as believers is, Lord, help me catch some of your personality. If you're in a sad season right now, ask the Lord to give you some of his sense of humor. The nature and character of God is not a cold, sterile, academic exercise. It's for doing real life with in the here and now. In the Holy Spirit, our faith is alive and it's dynamic. It's designed to change the world around us. And with that in mind, please turn to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter 11. A nice full house this morning. There's people in the balcony. Hello in the balcony. Are you there? What about you guys over there? Oh, there's King Charles. Oh, sorry, your majesty. I didn't see you there. What do you mean you're taking me to the Tower of London and chopping my head off later? <laughs> Acts chapter 11, reading from verse 27 to 30. Acts 11 27 to 30. Now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. This morning's message is entitled Confidence in the Present Chaos. Confidence in the Present Chaos. We are living in a time of great international upheaval. It looks like it's possible that World War III isn't so far down the line. We've just come out of a pandemic, a virus sabotaged the world and shut us down. I think we're entitled to still be asking a lot of questions about the true nature of this virus, where it came from, how our governments responded. In other words, do some old fashioned things like telling us the truth, telling us what's really going on. Of course, there's the economic chaos running riot around the world, big issues all lining up back to back, three hours flying time from Glasgow. There's a European war ablazing this morning. 
the first war fought on European soil since 1945. There's an old saying we have in the UK, which I think you have in the USA. We don't have our troubles to seek. The danger is we get sucked into the trauma and drama vortex. It's an invitation that's extended to all of us. But here's some inside track information. Turn it down. Turn down that invitation to get sucked into the trauma vortex. For we can have confidence in the present chaos. How can we have confidence in the present chaos? It's simple. When we look at the very real nature of crisis and chaos, all we need to do is pick up upon what the Lord is doing and obey. This morning we read in the book of Acts of a group of prophets on the move coming from Jerusalem to Antioch. Jerusalem, God's city, the heavy hitters, the A-team of the prophets heading to Antioch which actually was a church full of teachers and prophets. Acts 13 verse 1 reveals in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers. Anyway, one of the Jerusalem crew, Agabus, stood up and prophesied that there would be a famine coming on all of the known world. Oh my goodness me, that was time for everyone to start praying in tongues and to send Agabus back to Jerusalem. We wanted you to come here and pray that God would give us new donkeys, our own ministries, a symphonic worship orchestra for the prophetic church in Antioch. And there was Agabus, the party pooper, prophesying a famine coming on the known world. Why did he do that? It's simply this. It's simply this. When the New Testament church was born on the day of Pentecost, a prophetic age was ushered into the earth. The church is incredibly prophetic in the Holy Spirit We've never been anything other than prophetic. We have come through a restoration generation where the Lord has pioneered the prophetic all over the world. So we're going to focus on Agabus for a few moments as way of introduction. I've always been fascinated by Agabus. I'm convinced he's really Scottish that he was born in Scotland and his name was Angus. Born in the Shetland Islands with the descendants of Jim Sim. <laughs> and then he moved to the Middle East and changed his name to Agabus to be more culturally relevant. Anyway, there's Agabus, a prophet of the Lord. Probably one of the 70 sent out by the Lord Jesus in the book of Luke. He, according to church tradition, preached in many nations. And according to church tradition, he was martyred for his faith. The prophetic church in the book of Acts, in many ways, was an era where Agabus discovered his calling in Christ Jesus. And it was the days of Agabus then, it's the days of Agabus now. For Agabus carried high credibility, very high credibility. He was part of the launch of the church, entering into a prophetic age. And he delivered words. The Agabus age of the church 
meant that when prophets and the body of Christ prophesied, they were incredibly accurate. You could take them to the bank. You knew that God had spoken to you. We're in the days of Agabus, afresh. But the challenge before you and I this morning is this, that we have an inner willingness to enter to enter into prophetic maturity, to begin to mature as a people in the prophetic. We're in this prophetic age. There's no shame in being a prophetic individual. When people say you belong to the funny farm, you believe God speaks to you, we can smile at them. One of our best evangelical smiles By the way, who are you listening to? And by the way, you're living your life. You belong to the funny farm. We need never be ashamed of the fact we're a hearing community. Let me see your hands if the Lord has spoken through you to another believer. Hands all over the congregation. And the people that didn't raise their hands, watch out. Someone with their hand in the air a few seconds ago is coming to get you. <laughs> Just to practice, you see, as a sidebar, I've prophesied over the last 27 years across the world 120,000 people. And what I want to say in the back of that is people who have never been prophesied over before after they have been prophesied over, usually begin to hear from God for themselves at a deeper level and start to enter into the prophetic river. How did Agabus bring this word and on the back of the word a strategy to the people of God in Antioch? We read in Acts 11, verse 28, that Agabus began to indicate by the Spirit. He was only speaking something out that the Holy Spirit had indicated to him. In other words, he had Holy Spirit indicators. He might have been thinking of his wife back in Jerusalem. He might have been thinking about, is it not time that Saul of Tarsus wrote the New Testament. Like you and I, he was doing whatever was real in the here and now until his prophetic indicators began to come alive in the Holy Spirit. You may think it's okay for all the prophets and Agabus and all the great men and women of God, but if you know and love the Lord Jesus this morning, you have prophetic indicators. Your human spirit is coded for language in many areas. We know that software can make hard drives do great and wonderful things. Every time we send an email, great and wonderful things are happening in our IT system, and our iPad. How much more? Is a human spirit that's so coded by the Lord to respond to certain situations, how much more do we come alive when that area where we're coded to hear the voice of God begins to indicate some specific truths to our consciousness? That began the story for Agabus. It began the story, and then he prophesied a famine would come on the known world. A famine that would indeed ravish the known world during the reign of Claudius. Do you know that during the reign of Claudius, four famines came on the known world? I wonder if Agabus was prophesying all four. If he were here today, he would say, oh yes, yes, it was all four. 
Read it in my book. Watch out, famine coming, times four. Three for fifty dollars, give two to your friends. But his prophetic indicators deliver the message that the people of God needed to hear. We can be mightily encouraged that before the prophets from Jerusalem even landed in Antioch, God foreknew there was a famine coming on the world. God foreknew, and he already had a solution in mind. The Lord never responds to crisis. He's ahead of crisis. He is outside of time. In the mystery of Christ, all of us are in glory today enjoying enjoying the Lord Jesus. Because that's in our future. The Lord's in our future. He's outside of time. It's already happening in his economy. But here we are on planet Earth. Drinking coffee and trying to look holy. Amen. But the Lord had a solution and he began to move in the Holy Spirit that the church in Antioch would collaborate with the church in Jerusalem and begin a relief program that all the brothers living in Judea would be taken care of. We're living in times of incredible chi crisis and chaos, and they're all backed up one after the other. I will be 64 in November, and I've lived through lots of global and national crisis, but they've never been backed up one after the other. Pastor Wes, there's always been big spaces in between them, but the Lord has a solution for each and every one of them. And that solution That solution is in the hearts and minds of a prophetic generation. We're living in the days of Agabus. We're living in a great prophetic age. We're living in a day where we're maturing in the prophetic. We're maturing in the prophetic. That we can be entrusted by Almighty God to speak into global situations. Not false prophecies about revivals that never happen. Not soulish prophecies that would indicate that God is our warm and fuzzy. We don't do real life together, God in the sky. But prophecies that enter into that very raw arena of the public square. Where there's politics, where there's business with the social engagements, social structures. Doesn't all of the above need the prophetic word of God to bring healing to the nations? The first phase of the prophetic movement was a time of pioneering. I believe it ran roughly for about 25 years or thereabouts. Now we're in a time of consolidation. The pioneering movement was driven by men and women having gifts of prophecy that could impart and activate the gift of prophecy and bring forth prophets and prophetic worship all over the world. It was gift driven. Now, in this era of consolidation, it's all about community. It's all about corporate. The prophetic movement opened up the ears and eyes of a spirit to hear from God and to see God. But instead of it coming forth as a gift, it's being released into congregations as something corporate that would be like a megaton bomb against the works of the enemy. We've watched him unleash hell on earth. How much more is the Lord preparing you and I 
to release heaven and earth, to stand back and watch the God of peace crush Satan under our feet. The Lord has a solution for all the terrible things happening in America and across the world. But when Agabus gave that word after collaboration between the saints from Jerusalem and Antioch, there was a testing of the word, a deciding this word was true, and it mobilized the church. They put their hands in the pocket. They provided food, possibly finance, and medical aid, whatever medical aid looked like in that generation. And all the brethren, all the men and women of God, children, perhaps wider communities in Judea were taken well care of. They had a good missions budget. This church has a growing anointing on it and a growing missions budget. Can you imagine the volume of food and water and medical aid that was distributed throughout Judea, put into the hands of the elders of the church in Judea by Barnabas and Saul. Crisis on the earth means the release of a prophetic grace which mobilizes the saints. We are hearing the prophetic word of God in our generation. We're seeing the impact of the prophetic word of God in our generation. And we are being mobilized by the spirit of the living God in our generation. There's a shift in the church. We're now a post-charismatic church because the movement that restored Pentecost and the charismatic movement has come to an end. The Holy Spirit hasn't left the church. The movement has run its course. I believe we're in a post-charismatic movement now. For the Lord is doing a new thing. And he's not bolting it on to the past. When the Lord speaks, we can no longer have the luxury of saying, how can we add this to what we already are? The Lord will say, no, no, you don't do that. You run with what I'm telling you to do now and you watch the past become the past. A post-charismatic church is an alpha and omega people. Jesus is the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. The Lord had the first word on planet earth. He will have the last word on planet earth. He had the first word in the church. He will have the last word in the church. He had the first word in our lives. And he will have the last word in our lives. And no devil from hell can interrupt that process. It means as we think and process, reevaluate. And say, what does it mean to be an alpha and omega people? Then we can know we have confidence in the present chaos. Confidence that if this world were to give way, the promises of God would remain yes and amen in Christ Jesus. I ponder the alpha and omega people concept and theology and wonder I just wonder, I just wonder if we're the final generation of believers on the earth. This is a great prophetic age, but make no mistake, it's a great ap ap apocalyptic age that we are living our lives out right now. And here we are. We've been lots of things over the decades. I preached my first sermon in 1986, it was called, You Must Be Born Again. I was an original thinker back in those days. <laughs> it's been a long haul, a long haul from my conversion to Jesus Christ. 
in 1983. Alpha and Omega people, I'm asking you to go home this afternoon and reflect on your journey. Whether you're saved one year, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, this is like an auction, any advance in 50 years. <laughs> Don't scratch your nose, you'll leave here with a grandfather clock. <laughs> You've already got one in the house. Well, stop scratching your nose then. But the Lord has some things he would love to say to you as a fellowship. Life Church 7. You're called by my name, says the Lord. For nothing is an accident in my economy. I do things on the earth and allow my people to discern the very essence of my Holy Spirit that's in operation. And the very essence of my Holy Spirit in this house is reproduction, reproduction, reproduction. You're no longer a people of addition. You're now a people of multiplication. And I've called you to multiply in the prophetic. And I've called you to multiply in addicting people to missions. I'm blowing the cobwebs off the Victorian concept of missions. And I'm giving you a theology and revelatory truth that indicates 21st century missional work will be something the world has never seen before. Amen. For this is the century, says the Lord, Well, I will restore the fame of my son, Christ Jesus. Religions have cre recreated him to be something other than he is. And secular minds have mocked and ridiculed my son, Jesus. But this will be the century. He will walk across the stage of human affairs and be seen in a way that's utterly visible. That multitudes from other religions will say, Jesus is Lord. I, I have a strategy, says God, to win the secular mind by just loving them into submission. I will take great delight in making my enemies my closest friends. For the Lord says to you, as a church, there's a friendship anointing that's being birthed in your midst. It's already there, it's not something new, but the friendship of this house will cause men and women who've lived in abusive, secular environments to come in here and just cry and cry and cry. In fact, the Lord will draw so many secular-minded people to this house, you will have a crying section of the church. <laughs> you will say to newcomers, do you think you can go through the service without crying? They'll say, probably not. Sit over there. <laughs> Sit over there. This is the crying section of the church. This is a laughing section of the church. What were these two sections here? This will be the apostolic section of the church. And you will be the prophetic section of the church. What about the balcony? Should we go up and throw the people off the balcony into one of the sections? <laughs> you just have a word with King Charles at the end of the service. The balcony, the balcony. The balcony will be the section of the church where people feel wounded inside. But the Lord's inviting them to come to a place of intimacy with him. A place of intimacy need never be alone. And if you're hurting this morning, it's okay to be not okay. But as you come in and drink of Christ Jesus in this house, you will be okay very quickly. In fact, you will be 
Okay, cokey, very quickly. The wounded are masters at bringing healing to others because the wounded have something that most people don't have. The wounded, when they're healed, have incredible empathy for other people. When they say, I know something of what you feel, it's because they know something of what you feel. And all this is going on in this house right now. These are seeds that are germinating in your spirits right now. And I believe the final challenge in the prophetic word to the house is simply the Lord saying, grow as much as you can and then a lot more. The Lord's giving you grace to pray in a manner that's utterly ridiculous. And you think, well, Lord, we want to grow to this level. And you're thinking you're pushing it, maybe a bit, bit prideful. The Lord will smile at you and say, is that the best you can do? <laughs> There's almost like a ludicrous faith in this house, a ridiculous faith that logic will not be able to contain. The Lord says, go forth into this move of God and never look back and set fires to fellowships everywhere I will lead you. For this is going to be a national voice to the United States of America. Eight minutes, 42 seconds to go. And then I explode like I was never here to begin with. A big puff of smoke. You think this didn't happen, it was a bad dream. We'll be wakening up for church in any, any minute from now. Let's pray over a couple of people. Then we'll attack the chicken and the brisket. Amen. Can I pray for this lady here? Can I pray for you? Would you like to stand? What's your name, my sister? Karen. Come on out, Karen. Come on out into the aisle. This is Karen. The hand of the Lord is on you, Karen, ministering lots of comfort to your life. You've had a harder life than most people of your own generation. In fact, there's been cycles of your life where the enemy has fired his heaviest artillery into your life. All of our lives are made up of losses and gains, Karen. But it seems like the losses are way greater than the gains of your life. But the Lord says to you, women of God, the latter years of your life will be greater than the former years of your life. For all along, I've called you to be a dreamer. But round every corner, around every corner, the enemy had someone waiting to crush the dreams that you were carrying. But I'm bringing alive in you the dreamer again, says the Lord. And I'm going to send people to comfort you. Sometimes you struggle with the thought that anybody could really be interested in you in a deeper level at all. But the Lord says, I want to remove that thought process from your mind. I'm going to give you a diary bulging with coffee dates where people will want to know everything about you, to pray for you and to love on you as you move into the final phase of your life on earth. All along, you've been a dreamer and a great worshiper. Karen, you're a woman that's always carried great passion for that which really mattered to you but you've never really been allowed to express that passion but you're going to express the passion I have given you for my son Christ Jesus and champion the lives of many other people forward in days to come. The young people, the 20-somethings, young men and women will seek your counsel and ask you to pray for them for the Lord says, I am restoring the years the locusts have eaten in your life. 
by giving you a prayer life that will cause demons to have heart attacks. The Lord says to you this morning, I'm depositing in your spirit elements, elements of the anointing of Catherine Kuhlman. For I am saving the best wine until last in your life. And this will give you a sense of value, a sense of purpose, and an edgy faith where you dare to believe and push the faith envelope further than you've ever pushed the faith envelope in your life. For I am truly with you, says God. God bless you. You're very precious to Jesus. Amen. Can I pray for you? Would you like to stand? Amen. What's your name? Kendall. Kendall. You're a fireball, Kendall. Goodness. Does anyone have a fire extinguisher? This woman's blazing in the Holy Spirit. And the Lord calls you a fire starter, a teacher of the word and a fire starter with a hatred for Satan. You never send him a Christmas card and when he walks in the room, you knock 10 bells out of him. I've given you a hatred of the works of evil because of what the works of evil do to people. Fundamentally, you're a pragmatist. As much as you spend a lot of time in the realm of the spirit, you're a pragmatist because nothing brings more fulfillment to your life than helping people. You would give someone your last dollar. There's a sense of how many people can I help today? You've even helped your enemies. There's people that have tried to damage your life that you've ended up helping, even ministering mercy and grace to. But the Lord says to you, women of God, the greatest days of your life are ahead of you. Because today there is a commissioning service, an ordination service taking place in the sanctuary. And the Lord calls you, O woman of God, to be a prophetess to the kingdom of heaven. A prophetess that will minister my mercy and deliverance to the people of God. You all have already moved in gifts of healing in the past. But the Lord says you've been in the shallow end. Now I'm giving you a double portion of that anointing. To go after organic diseases in people's bodies. Instead of sniffles and colds and headaches and you went way beyond killing COVID a long time ago. Now you're going to kill some serious illnesses in people's lives. I'm calling you to be a killer, to kill sickness and disease in people's bodies by the power of gift of healing within you. You're a well-rounded spirit. You've read much, you've studied much. You've been engaged in different levels of ministry over the years, but the ministry of a prophetess will fulfill you in a way that nothing else has fulfilled you. The Lord is cancelling from your life residual grief that you're carrying. You've carried residual grief for too long and you've been haunted by the circumstances of residual grief. But the Lord is cancelling that this morning and says, no more, be gone. For I am with you, says the living God. And my kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And the final phase of your life on earth will be a phase of life absolutely peppered with eternal perspectives. When you're getting prepared to go to glory, most of you will already be there. 
with just a little left of you on the earth to comfort the people that are already beginning to miss you. And selflessness comes your deliverance and selflessness. I am glorified, says the Lord. And in selflessness, you will know the fullness of maturity in my Son, Christ Jesus. For I am truly with you, says God. Thank you. Thank you. See you tonight. Be there and be triangular. <laughs>